I think they're having a trouble. I think the ride broke down. <laughs> We've been sitting in this boat now for, what, five minutes? And nothing happens. We're stuck by that first ghost that you see steering a ship. And it's really backed up behind us. Here's Mike in front of the camera, but you don't see it. <laughs> It's too dark. this uh, place for the first time. We have some really nice things like tuna sandwich. It's the first place where I see vegetable on the menu. It's at the end of Frontierland, close to the Liberty Square. Chicken and seafood, it says. And the prices are okay too. A 360 degrees view. How about that? remind me of penguins on a floating piece of ice. Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer. I love the cartoon series. Loved how he used to run along the canal, the river, the Mississippi River, when one of these boats, big boats, would come in and he would run along along the riverside. So cute. Oh, I'm sorry. Selective, yeah. This is so cute. That duck is being pushed away because of because of this. Uh, how do you call that? Because of what this what this boat is creating here. She's trying to. Uh, to swim against it, which is being pushed away. Upstream, against the street. Look at that. It looks like a, a peacock. 
I don't think it is. We suspect it's an uh, animatronic. Should we go for the boat ride? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ourselves on that floating piece of ice. We're going to explore Tom Sawyer's Island. Oh, we already fell home. Look, there's a windmill. We're going to the mysterious caves. Yeah. Oh. Just trying to give you a feeling, sense of what well, we're experience right now. Screaming? Can you hear them screaming, Mike? Please. Wow, look what we found, guys. A fort. Hey, there's Mike. It's exciting. Let's go look for Mike. Some more. 
local community go higher. Whoa. We got ourselves a John Wayne here. Bam, bam. I think he's shooting at these people who come the mountain ride. <laughs> <laughs> Inside the old meal, one of Disney's first most, or I should say, oldest animation. The old meal. Look that video up, guys. It's called. Look it up on this uh, on YouTube, for example. Disney's old meal. Awesome technique he used. Awesome, awesome. I love it. It's one of my most favorite Disney videos. Like in that clip, in that animation movie, you will see here too a bird's nest with a bird still in it. The parade. The parade is taking now another route because the main street is of course not available because of all the the rebuilding they're doing. So this is how we do that now. It's actually a good solution. Wow, I never knew that these parade carriages would actually fit through these these streets on this side. They're sleeping beauty. Or at least the dress, the nice we're making for her. It's fun because now you see the parade, you see these boats, you see the Mississippi Queen who just left, that just left, and you see the people, you see the the background. We're gonna buy some snacks right behind Ariel's castle. You never knew they sold this here, right? Right behind her castle is Thank this. Uh, yeah. 
30 minutes. constantly working. That was Princess Diana from The Princess and the Frog. Really good movie. If you haven't seen it, it's really worth watching. Look at these people squeezed together. But you know, sometimes you have a better view from far away. This is Mickey Mouse with his friend. How cute is this? running from left to right. Ah. A rabbit running. Featuring as narrator, Academy Award-winning actor, Morgan Freeman. We hold these truths to be self-evident. in Philadelphia, a dream was born. In a time of emperors and kings, it was an astounding revolutionary dream that we, the people, should choose our own leaders, that they should be one of us.
This was a dream born of fire, safeguarded by sacrifice during a brutal winter at Valley Forge. Yet it was a dream that was almost over before it had truly begun. The war for independence had left the American colonies bankrupt. Leaders argued, unpaid troops rebelled, and some even cried out for a return to monarchy and for General George Washington to be crowned King of America. But the man who had led an army of farmers to victory over the mighty British Empire made it clear that the only title he desired was citizen of the United States of America. I am at a loss to conceive what part of my conduct could have given encouragement to an idea which to me seems the greatest mischief that can befall our country. If you have any regard for yourself, banish these thoughts from your mind. But when the new nation finally adopted its constitution, and it came time to elect its first president, there were no doubts about who that president should be. Only he had such doubts. I fear my countrymen will expect too much of me. I walk on untrodden ground. There is scarcely any part of my conduct which may not hereafter be drawn into precedent. In the end, Washington set the most important precedent of all. The man who could have been king stepped down after two terms in office and took his place again amongst the people. By insisting that he was, above all other things, one of us, he made it possible for any of us to dream of serving the nation in its highest office. And one day, sure enough, it came to pass that a man who wasn't an aristocrat aspired to the office of president. Andrew Jackson was a battle-forged frontiersman, and according to his predecessor, President John Quincy Adams, a barbarian who cannot write a sentence of grammar and can hardly spell his own name. To which Jackson merely replied, It's a damn poor mind indeed that can't think of at least two ways to spell a word. He may have lacked a formal education, but he was tough and brilliant. Just the ticket for a new nation of Americans struggling to turn a dream into an enduring reality. They swept Jackson into office by a landslide and then descended on his inauguration, determined to shake his hand in person. Why, 20,000 country people shoved to get in the door, no. track their muddy boots across the carpet. And my dear, they would be here still if we hadn't placed tubs of punch out on the lawn. Washington's elite fumed, but Jackson loved it, for these were his people. He was proud to be one of us. I do not forget that the planter, the farmer, the mechanic, and the laborer form the great body of the people of the United States. They are the bone and sinew of this country. But Andrew Jackson would wage a mighty struggle to hold that great body of people together. State by state, a monstrous injustice that had haunted the country since its beginning was now tearing it apart. As civil war threatened, we searched deep in our heartland for a leader equal to the ordeal ahead. It was perhaps a vindication of the American dream that we found a plain-spoken, self-taught lawyer from Illinois whose campaign platform could be summed up in five simple words. All men are created equal. I say this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln's words touched the hearts of reasonable men. And in 1860, we sent him to Washington, where he would face the hardest task that any American president would ever face. I know there is a God, and that he hates injustice and slavery. I see the storm coming. I know his hand is in it. 
If he has a place, work for me. And I think he has. I believe I'm ready. I am nothing. But truth is everything. And with God's help, I shall not fail. April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter. The cannon spoke for war, bitter, violent, and devastating. The blood of half a million Americans shared in the dark days of our civil war. But as the sun rose on a cold November day in 1863, thousands of Americans gathered on the battlefield in Gettysburg to hear President Abraham Lincoln give meaning to our sacrifice. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war, we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this crowd. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living here, rather than to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This nation did have a new birth of freedom. And as our frontiers pushed west, we looked for new leaders that embodied our bold and new spirit. Leaders like Theodore Roosevelt, born to wealth and privilege, but imbued with the spirit of the American frontier. He rode with cowboys and led his rough riders up San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War. This kind-hearted, tough guy fought against monopolies and for the working class. We called him Teddy. Anything else would have been far too formal. He even refused to call his official residence the Executive Mansion. To him, it was just a house. It was just a white house. And so, it would always be called. Three decades later, his distant cousin Franklin Delano Roosevelt would occupy that same White House and lead the country through its hardest trials since the Civil War. A world war was looming, and the Great Depression had paralyzed a great nation. <laughs> the president we called upon to lead us through those hard times was himself paralyzed by polio.
but with determined optimism, he had triumphed. And now he was ready to share his cheerful strength with a badly frightened people. During FDR's fireside chats on the radio, <laughs> entire cities came to a standstill and listened. Of the people themselves, let us unite in banishing fear. Together, we cannot fail. In a calm and reassuring voice, he called out to America, and America answered back. We're just modest, middle-class people having lost what little we have. My savings are tied up in a closed bag. I believe that you will guide us through these Protect dark us days. Protect us from that conflict in Europe, dear president. Birthday, and I expect to be in service shortly. Now we know we are not fighting alone. I feel that at last we can hope. With that hope, we began to believe in the future again. FDR had reminded us of the power of the American dream. Sixteen years later, America's youngest elected president once again called upon the power of the people to change the world. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. John F. Kennedy's stirring words ushered in a historic decade of civic activism in which ordinary Americans struggle to right old wrongs and chart new frontiers of possibility. It has always been the role of presidents to remind us of our roots, to call us to the future. In their best moments, they speak words that are already there in our hearts, especially in times of tragedy. I would have given that not to be standing here today. We mourn seven heroes. We mourn their loss as a nation together. You have lost too much, but you have certainly not lost America. For we will stand with you. and our journeys continue. And as our journeys continue, what once seemed revolutionary now seems profoundly simple. That we should choose our own leaders. That our hopes should be their hopes. Our fears, their fears. Our dreams, their dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, the presidents of the United States. George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe, John Quincy Adams, <coughs> Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, James K. Polk, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, Abraham Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, Chester A. Arthur, Grover Cleveland, 
Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Woodrow Wilson, Warren G. Harding, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, Richard M. Nixon, Gerald R. Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush. And now we come to the present, a present that is rooted in our past. For all of Liberty's leaders have one thing in common, one trust they all accepted. My fellow citizens, no event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that notification on the 14th day of April, 1789, that you had selected me to lead our nation. But it was with the confidence of my fellow citizens that I took an oath, 35 simple words that have been repeated by every American president throughout history. As long as that oath is taken and solemnly fulfilled, the American dream will endure. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. Ladies and gentlemen, President Barack Obama. The American dream is as old as our founder, but as timeless as our hopes. It is reborn every day in the heart of every child who wakes up in a land of limitless possibilities, in a country where we the people means all the people. We may come from different places and believe in different things, but what makes us American is a shared spirit, a spirit of courage and determination, of kindness and generosity. It is a spirit grounded in the wisdom of the generations that have gone before us, but open to the unimagined discoveries and possibilities on the horizon that lies ahead. Let us enjoy it, cherish it, defend it, and pass it on to our children as the bright and beautiful blessing it is, this enduring American dream. Is that what I'm hearing? Let's get loud. Jennifer Lopez? No. Come on. This is Disney, not some top, top 40 hits. Oh well, I think they're trying to keep the young ones interested. We're having where well, we are having dinner. 
this evening. I think we can fairly say that we almost tried, well, maybe not all of them, but definitely most of the restaurants here and in downtown Disney. And it has been so much fun to pick different place every, every day. So this is where you check in. Ah, look. Oh, there. Oh, the camera. Ah, this is where you check in. This is where I just was just standing. That's the castle. And then we go and wait there for our table. That's very nice. This is where you wait for your table. This is where you wait to be seated. And there is the exit of the park. So these people are in standby. Yeah. But we, Mike, was clever as always, <laughs> and he made reservation. And we have this thing. When this when this thing starts to vibrate, means we can go in. We have this thing too at the Fapiano restaurant. It's really nice concept. That way you don't have to wait for nothing. You can just go stand here outside maybe. <laughs> it's getting cold. As you can hear, most of the screaming is made by children because they're just, they're racked at the end of the day. Their parents made them walk and walk and walk. At the end of the day, they're just, they're burned out. Poor kids. We see parents dragging their kids, literally dragging them. And sometimes we even see kids crying, screaming their lungs out, not wanting to go into some attraction. And yet the parents just drag them in. It's so sad. It kills us to see that. You know how many times I did a retake? I don't want to miss them inviting us in. So come on, guys. Invite us in. Invite us in. But I'm going to go after Eeyore's tail. Ah, all these people desperately looking to see if they can make a reservation on short notice. I hope they will. You got hungry from all that running around. Yay, finally! <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, we just have our, had our picture taken with Tigger. He was really awesome. Very sweet.
mensen hebben dat. Waar? Diglett. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Diglett is my favorite. She's so cute and so shy and always depending on who the bear to help him. Do they have, Mike? Take a look. Uh, that's all. That's not much. You're so cute. Yum, it looks also good. So Mike has the brownie, the carrot cake, and something something. Raspberry. Raspberry, yeah. I had strawberry and cheesecake. it's a cheesecake, yeah. And flum. I love flum. Yum. Oh, there's the castle. I had to show you that. Um Kalthum is bad thing. You guys know Um Kalthum? Look her up. She's amazing. Well, she was amazing. She's dead. That's where Aladdin and Jasmine stand. There were bubbles. Bubbles being projected on the castle. But sometimes my camera acts funny so before I could show it to you it was, it was gone so I'm sorry guys This is literally a dark ride. Come on. Come on, come on, wherever you are. Oh, there he is. That's not, oh, it's not our place, this. No, this, this is a So from both sides? No, the castle is there, so that's the front. This is being detonated far behind. Wow. This is beautiful. This is the view from Thunder Mountain. We just got off the ride. Now we saw all this from the ride. It was awesome, guys. If you want to do Thunder Mountain, do it. Do it after it gets dark. Firework time. Firework time. It's a total different experience. The whole ride is different. They have these bats and things glowing in the dark. It's really beautiful. Wow, that was a star. Wow, beautiful, wow, it looks more beautiful in real than on the screen, so I wish I could pull you all out the screen and bring you here guys to watch this, this 
maybe someday in the future they will have that technology. I can just beep, beep you up. Lights up. Beautiful. Beautiful. There's more coming. I look everywhere. I don't know whether to film this or this. That was it? Was that it? Yeah? I don't know. We might surprise you. See? you. Wow. These look like flowers. It's so beautiful. Keep them coming, goats. That one looks like Saturn. Wow. I love the, the sound, the blast. There's a lot of wind up there. It's beautiful to see how the smoke, fireworks leaves behind, gets dragged away by the wind. Beautiful. No. <laughs> no. There's still more where that came from. Look, they're like angel wings. <coughs> it's like gold raining down from the sky. That one looks like a dandelion. Wow, it's so impressive. It's like the whole sky is full. The whole sky is just full with fireworks. This is so impressive, guys. You have to see this in real. No way I can share that with you through a screen. No way. The crowd starts right. Whoa. Whoa! 
Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. It's packed. This is a wall of and people. And here. Who knows? <laughs> it's people leaving the strollers behind. This is so funny. You know what? We used them. We're finished now. We're just gonna dump them on the middle of the road. Thank you, Disney. Yeah, these people put back what you used. But uh, you don't see, but there's really a wall of people in front of us. And it's now what time? 8 15? 8 20. Everybody's leaving. Thank you for the nice memories.